Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks from the New Art School. Our guest today is Tony Edison. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's fantastic to have you here. So yeah, tell us you. about you and your work. Um, well, I'm, um, I've been in education, um, in higher education, for around 30 years now. Uh, prior to that, trained as an architect, worked in architecture and um, practices in London, um, Paris, Chester, and um, then got into higher education as a lecturer and um, really took it from there. I didn't, it didn't take long for me to uh, get itchy feet, actually, to, to leave the UK. So I think over my career, I'm, I must have worked in, uh, you know, across nine, ten countries, but, uh, but in particular um, in Australia, in Singapore, Mauritius, and uh, currently in Egypt. Yeah, all in design and media, most of it, most of it teaching, um, but uh, for the past 20, 20 years, a combination of, uh, of teaching and, uh, and leadership with heading up departments and then ultimately heading up and starting up uh, new universities in various parts of the world, but still still trying to keep my foot in uh, teaching as well. I, I can't get away from it and I, I don't want to. So you've created many art schools all over the world. Yeah, that, that really started off with um, my role in Singapore, working for a university that was based in Australia. One of its main branches was in Singapore, where, where I was based. And I think during the time I was there, I, I was involved in setting up uh, seven um, branch campuses, uh, China, Malaysia, um, India, uh, Sri Lanka, Auckland, New Zealand, again, back in Australia, uh, where else? Um, Hong Kong and a, and a place called Ulaanbaatar in outer Mongolia, which was uh, a strange one, but, uh, but successful. So tell us about this. What, what, what is it you, you have gained from all this experience? What is it that you, you want to share with us? Um, I think I've always had a, a really deep interest in, in traveling. That was one, but never, never traveling to go on holiday. It was always traveling to, to spend a month at least somewhere as a holiday, but doing something hmm. and, uh, you know, trying to, to experience the culture, trying to get to know the people, learning a few words of the language, learning some of the traditions. Uh, I found that the most interesting part. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's funny how you can combine that desire with higher education. Um, you know, if you, if a lot of people that want to travel are quite happy to stay at the same university or within the same place or even within the UK. Uh, but if, if you do have an urge to want to travel, uh, I'd say a job in um, higher education is a good one to have to enable that, mm. or it has been for me anyway. Absolutely. So how, how has that changed? How has international education changed since you started? Um, I think the, the, it, it's changing all the time, and I think over the past 20 years, it's really changed quite rapidly in so much as most of my work in the early days, traveling, um, for UK universities in particular, was to recruit um, international students. So going to recruitment fairs, having events at their colleges, um, having events that were held by our recruitment agents in, in various countries. But over the past 20 years, that's, that still goes on, but to a lesser degree, I think there's a, a momentum um, certainly developing and, and it's uh, well established now for international branch campuses. So for, a, for an established university, again, most of my experience is with the UK. So let's think mm -hmm. and any established UK university mm -hmm. would um, strive to, upon you know doing some due diligence, looking where markets were, 
looking where it was safe um, in terms of um, uh, investment and in terms of reputation uh, to establish themselves overseas and to where it could use that branch campus to to draw students back to the home campus in the UK. Mm. They they would find a partner, typically a, a, um, a partner within that country, and they would provide things. Um, maybe they would provide finance. Typically, they would provide a building. Sometimes the, the governance, the laws within those countries um, stipulate that it's mandatory to have uh, a partner within that country. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's no choice there. But but typically the partner would provide the infrastructure to the home university to conduct their business as a university. And um, yeah, the, the, the teaching and the support is interesting because there are various models for that. But, um, mm -hmm. but typically the curriculum would be the same, if not very similar. Uh, as the the home university, you know the same learning outcomes, the same uh, assessments, etc. Mm -hmm. But local staff would be uh, be employed to do the work, rather than typically rather than expats going across to teach. Mm -hmm. Although you do get some of that, but uh, yeah. So so basically, the, the, the university tries to provide at least educationally. Uh, in the classroom, uh, a very similar learning experience to that which the student would have if they studied at home in the UK. And typically they graduate with exactly the same degree mm -hmm. from the mother university. Yeah, but so that, that's what I've been spending my time on. Right? Fantastic. I'd say 15 years. How does it change the community? How does the art school impact the community there? Uh, when it's done well, I mean, what, what we strive to do in the UK, if, if that is done well uh, at the overseas branch campus, then um, it, it's fantastic. And when I see it, what I mean is links with industry. Um, so we get live projects coming in. You know, we're, we're talking about um, creative industries here, art and design in particular, but that really applies to engineering, uh, medicine, uh, yeah. computing business. So um, links with industry, when that's done well, it's, uh, you know, it's impactful for the, uh, for the region, for the locality, for the region, if not the country. Um, having guest speakers in from industry, mm. that's really interesting. And through those relationships, being able to develop um, internships, so students can spend some time in industry. So that, that link with industry is really important. We do a lot of it in the UK. Mm. When overseas branch campuses do that and do it well, that's, uh, that works really well. Tell us about an art school that really stands out in your mind, one of those you created. One that I created? Yeah. Um, the, most, the one that stands, oh, really stands out. Well, there's, there's a... There's a few. I mean, I've had mm. really great experiences at all of them. Mm, of course. And a, couple, and a couple of times I've inherited something that's already been set up, but very early on. Mm. So really where it didn't have any student um, graduations at that point. But two recent ones, um, University of Middlesex uh, in Mauritius mm. established their uh, first overseas branch campus. Uh, within three years, we'd uh, gone from 11 students in the first year, which is hardly sustainable, to over 700 by the end of year three. Wow. In fact, within three years, we grew out of the initial building. And yeah. um, <laughs> luckily, one of the, one of the old uh, colonial, French colonial families who owned most of the sugar plantations in Mauritius, they decided that they didn't want to uh, grow sugar anymore. They'd rather develop it into a, um, an educational hub, which they oh, did. Wow. Yeah, they did. They put accommodation on their libraries. Uh, they built the infrastructure and then invited universities from France and uh, the UK in particular to come and establish themselves there. So we moved. We moved over to that, which is a beautiful place by the beach, 
um, a backdrop of wonderful mountains in an idyllic island, the middle of the Indian Ocean. That one worked well. That was that was good. Uh, the most recent one, of course, is um, Coventry University yeah. at uh, the Knowledge Hub Universities. And again, the Knowledge Hub Universities, it's a private venture by a large uh, company in, uh, it's an electrical company, if you like. They, they have a number of companies under, under their belt and they do a variety of things, but it's, uh, it's all concerned with power. But there was a desire by the, by the chairman the owner of the company to be altruistic. So they diversified funding to go into education. And one of these projects was setting up uh, a large knowledge hub, hence the name, the Knowledge Hub Universities, uh, on the outskirts of Cairo. Mm. That's the new administrative center where the, the embassies are relocating. The president has relocated his palace and it's it's been a building site for the past three years, but it's really getting into shape now. Wow. Yeah, and Coventry University was their first direct, was the first partner. I was the first um, director of the campus and head of school of design and media. And uh, yeah, it's going really well, recruiting students. They're all having a, a great time. We're having our first graduation in 2023. So yeah, it's, uh, it was good. We made an impact and they're doing all, all the things that I mentioned before about links with industry, invited speakers. Um, I don't think I mentioned the importance of scholarships that uh, maybe we could talk about that later. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, they're doing all of that. So, uh, you know, I'm wishing them, I'm leaving. I'm, I've done my three years there. I'm leaving in August and returning to the UK, but uh, I do wish them all the best. They've got off to a very good start. Amazing. You still haven't told us a story about how you got into teaching, though, about your first teaching experience. I got into teaching when I was still at university. Wow. Um, yeah. So uh, my degree and master's were, were pretty full on. Mm. Um, I did work, but not in teaching. I did work as a bouncer at a nightclub and a casino <laughs> during the evenings. If I were to stand up, you can see I'm a I'm a big guy, so I would. I worked at a nightclub uh, during my uh, years at university, but when I went to when I went on to um, to London at um, City University in London to to continue, uh, I worked in teaching a part time job in teaching at uh, Chelsea School of Art mm -hmm. in London, and I, I was teaching computer-aided design. There was no virtual reality yes, or of course. reality back then. Uh, basically, AutoCAD and 3D Studio, I, yes. was, uh, I was teaching that while I, while I was learning at another university. Um, and then I continued that. And I think that expertise that I learned, we, we were few and far between. Most people who were, who were into and capable of of working in computer-aided design. There weren't very many of us at that time. And uh, I was offered, through a friend, uh, I was introduced to head of an architecture studio uh, in Wigmore Street in London uh, called Stuart McCall, who had a, a interior design, architecture, industrial design practice uh, called McCall Associates um, in London. So I worked there. And um, one of the partners left and he took up a partnership in Chester in the north of England, beautiful town near Wales. And he offered me a role there to set up their computer ready design department, which I did for a couple of years. And then my first teaching role was at Manchester University where, um, yeah, that, I really did fancy working in teaching. Mm. Uh, when, when I left it behind, I missed it. And even though I enjoyed practice, yeah. uh, I preferred teaching. So I, I got back into teaching and I've done that full time with a, with a few hobbies in between. Yeah. Uh, like, like what? What are your hobbies? 
Oh gosh, well, sculpting. Yeah. I sculpt. I paint. Well, what what material do you like using? Um, well, I'm I'm using a lot of uh, I'm I'm using a whole range of materials for sculpting. What I what I tend to do is sculpting clay, mm -hmm. and then uh, create a scan, a three dimensional mm -hmm. scan. Take that into a product called uh, ZBrush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, tweak it, work in there in a lot more detail, a, yeah. a lot better than I could do in clay because you can zoom right in to put wrinkles in eyes, which is a bit difficult yes. with my huge fingers in a, in a clay model. And um, yeah, and then typically use a 3D printer to, to print that out and mm -hmm. uh, paint that in metallic paints, put acid on it to give it a patina. Wow. And uh, there we are. <laughs> That's what I use. Are there any parallels between running a nightclub and running a university? Yeah, um, people skills, mm. I think. I think, well, at university, I, I've never had to break up too many fights. And <laughs> I've, I've, I've never had to drive anyone to hospitals, the emergency unit, because oh my God. they've drank too much alcohol. Yeah. But yeah, people skills, I think. Yeah. Um, being calm, mm. a good listener. Um, being decisive, mm. I, I think those are skills that of course, are absolutely, considerable. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, what what is the next project for you? What what is next for you? Gosh, well, my next project, uh, I think I'll continue with the sculpting a little, just because a couple of years ago I I did have a bit of success. Um, there's a um, an industrialist in. Cyprus, mm. who visited Rio and he saw the statue of Christ the Redeemer, which I think is 40 meters tall. Yes, yes. And um, he, he lives in a, in a town in Cyprus, northern Cyprus, actually, uh, that has a, a beautiful mountain range um, at the back of the, of the town. And uh, I believe he owns one of the mountains or some of the land on one of the mountains. And he wanted, as a legacy, I guess, plus, you know, he'll have other reasons for doing this. He wanted something slightly larger than Christ the Redeemer to be built oh, okay. on top of this mountain. So a couple of years ago, he, um, he, he put out an internet, a course for artists to submit their um, maquettes for yes. a, uh, an international competition for this, uh, you know, for this piece of sculpture. And the title was The, the Noble Peasant, you know, the, the origins of the Cypriot people. I, uh, I don't think any, any Cypriot would mind, mind me saying that they are uh, a peasant nation originally, farmers, etc., cetera, and, uh, and proud of that. And they've, and they have that heritage, a pri uh, quite a proud heritage. Mm. Um, anyway, the the theme was the noble peasant. Uh, Ninety professional sculptors and artists from around the world uh, submitted, and um, I was a runner-up. Oh wow! Yeah, a Dutch artist uh, who's a fantastic professional sculptor, uh, a lady. Uh, she won the competition. Whether it's going to be built or not. Who knows? It's 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 um, you know some of the when it went to a public forum, some some of the public liked it, some didn't. There's an issue between North and South, or you know, the yes, Cyprus and Northern yes, Cyprus. Yeah. And the statue will be clearly visible from mm. uh, from all of Cyprus. So there are people for it and against it. So will it be mm. built? I don't know. But uh, you know, in that lineup of professional artists, I was quite happy. In fact, more than happy to um, you know be runner-up in that. Congratulations! So, uh, so it was, as I say, it's only a hobby. But maybe I'll take that hobby a bit further now with that sort of recognition. But the other thing I'd like to do, Left Terrace, of course, is continue with education. Hmm. Um, I've seen a lot of universities doing well. Uh, I've worked for a lot of private universities and 
within the private sector, there's always there's always a fine balance between a university as an educational institution, you know, providing higher education for its students. Is that the focus, or is the focus the shareholders? Yeah. And there's a, there's a, there's it's difficult to make that balance. It really is. So it, it um, needs a visionary leader. Uh, it, I happened I happened to, I happened to work for one for Good. some years, and uh, as soon as the visionary leader changed, left it, the whole thing just yeah, it would. Changed. It would. I know. I I think as soon as the university top management start talking about more about industry and uh, shareholders yeah. uh, to the detriment of student achievement and attainment, yeah. then it's time to worry. But, you know, luckily I've been working for some really good universities who have put student experience first. But that's what I, that's what I want to continue. So yeah. my origins are in Scotland and oh, wow. um, I have a woodland there, quite a large, quite a large forest. What I wanted to do was to set up a forest school. So, but I'm also looking at a building that's just come up for sale, not too far from where the forest is. It's quite a unique, quirky building. And uh, let, let's see how that goes. But whatever, whatever happens, I'd like to start up a school, a school of yes. maybe not focused on design as such, mm. but certainly uh, one around um, creative thinking, design thinking, mm. Mm. because, uh, you know, what, what I've found in all students across all disciplines is that the things that really matter is at the end of the day, is their attitudes yes. towards their learning. Yes. You know, if, if students come in not really motivated, if they're a bit blasé, if they're not hungry for education, um, maybe if they don't see a purpose in what they're doing, they'll achieve mediocre results and they may not enjoy it as much as they would. And certainly the impact upon graduation, their impact in the workplace isn't going to be um, as impactful as it could, could and should be. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all well and good teaching skills, but I, I think changing mindsets in higher education and um, developing confidence, self-esteem mm. is is really important as well. Mm. Because without that, you know, you there'll be a fear about experimenting, a fear about failing, which is essential to create, yes. especially yes. in our, our domains. Absolutely. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm gonna try to uh, to apply what I've learned and um, see how it goes. This is very exciting stuff. Uh, so again, if, if there was no limitations, what would you do differently? If, if you have like infinite amount of money, you know, or resources, and there was no limitations, there was no sort of you know, restrictions, what would you do in, in, in your school? Well, if there was an infinite amount of money, what, what I'd like to do is put some of that money towards um, scholarships mm. for deserving students, Quite a, lot, quite a lot of scholarships that are out there at the moment, are, are, not all of them, but they're typically focused towards merit, students who have achieved really well. You know, top sportsmen, top at maths, top at this, top at that. But what, what I'd like to do is, is focus on those that are, you know, have that, have that desire to learn, have that hunger to learn, um, but finance is holding them back. Mm. And I experienced that quite a lot in places like Mauritius, yeah. a, a little bit in Egypt, but not so much, but certainly in Mauritius, where, um, I, you know, I was fighting, not fighting with, working with the government uh, on providing scholarships for higher education to, you know, financially challenged families who typically, otherwise, they typically have to choose one member of their uh, family the fund to go to university and all the other kids would have to go to work or, or do something else. Or they'd have to sell land or remortgage their house, etc., which caused an awful lot of stress and it put a lot of stress on the student as well, you know, knowing that they were responsible for their family going into so much debt. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd put quite a lot of that infinite amount of money left there into scholarship. 
You also have a project about that, right? Yeah, I, I do. Um, yeah, tell us about that. Tell you a little bit about that. Okay. Again, it goes back to Mauritius, and I mm. was working with my, my university at the time and the government uh, there, the uh, Ministry of uh, Education, Science and Research, and one of the ministers, to encourage the, the government to provide scholarship to you know, financially uh, Mauritian families, students in financial hardship, um, but also for any foreign universities, and there were an awful lot of them, over 40, for any foreign university to come into Mauritius and set up there, they had to provide. They didn't at the time, not all of them, but I wanted the government to impose upon those universities to provide a good number of scholarships for local mm -hmm. students to be able to study there. Yeah. And why, why would I do that? Okay, one reason was diversity. I, I really do believe the more diverse a cohort is within a class, um, you know, the better the experience. Okay, not, not, just in, not just in terms of ethnicity, not just in terms of gender, but in terms of background as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, typically, if a, if a foreign university were to set up in another country and keep their home university fees, in other words, charge as much as they do in the UK, then it's an astronomical amount for anybody to pay in that foreign country. And so the profile of people you get coming into class are middle class, if you want to call them, it's wealthy, it's wealthy yeah. students yeah. who might not have that hunger to learn, who might not value their education as much, Absolutely. who aren't fearful of not having a job if they don't graduate. Yeah, you see what I mean? I might not have that amount. A lot of them do, but a lot of them don't. And their experiences tend to be a little bit generic, where it's always good to mix up experiences, I think, within the classroom from people from all sorts of different backgrounds. So that was, that was the reason why. The other one was, let's call it financial fairness, if you like. Mm -hmm. If a foreign university sets up in a foreign country Typically, um, and they uh, they charge home university fees, UK university fees, for example. Then in the UK, typically universities spend at least eighty percent, if not higher, on staff salaries. The staff, academic staff, comparatively, are, are, are reasonably paid in the UK. Their salaries are, are reasonable, comparatively internationally. Whereas in developing countries, um, if local staff uh, are employed, they typically get a very small fraction of, mm. of that salary. In other words, the university is, is earning more, a lot more. And that should go back in some way to as scholarships, you know, full scholarships to help students study. So I, I'm in a fairness sort of way. So anyway, um, because my university did offer scholarships, uh, I had a lot of students and their families coming to ask, how do I apply for one? They had to uh, provide a written application, had to mm. go to an interview. You know, how, how do I do that? Um, so I, you know, virtually every day I was meeting with families and students, giving them tips on how to apply for a university scholarship, whether it was to study in Mauritius or overseas. And, uh, I, I was getting a bit tired repeating the same thing over and over. So I wrote, I wrote a, a small book on, on winning university scholarships and uh, just gave that out for free. And um, that's now been translated into seven different languages. Amazing. Uh, I've, I've got sponsorship now from a wonderful company in uh, Cairo, of all places, who, do cloud, who develop cloud-based books. Um, where it's easier to, you know, to propagate this. Yeah, there are, there's no paper, no photocopies involved anymore. So, yeah, I'd I'm, I'm taking that forward. That's really exciting. Yeah, and what I'd like to do on, is to get more translations. There are, there are about seven translations at the moment, but uh, I'd like to get more different language okay. translations out there. And then hopefully via the ministries of education in, in various countries, 
get these out to the students who need them. That's that's incredible. That's a, that's a yeah. fantastic project. Thank you. So how can our viewers and listeners find you in order to come to you and, and help you with the translations? Um, I, I don't know exactly how to how to do this, if there is, you know. Um, Maybe I'll create a GoFundMe page. Right. It's a, it's a thought at the moment. What, I, what I'm looking at, what I'm looking at doing is working with the seven language translations that I have, and then developing a website for them. Right. Uh, and then having the books online for people to to download and access. I think once that's set up, um, I'll be in a better place to know how to get more people involved. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at, at the moment, it's. Uh, it's a project, but I'm, it's in progress. Let's call it that. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> but if anybody wants to contact me in the meantime, then yeah, I'd, I'd love them to. And uh, uh, how do they do that? I'm happy to give my email address. Okay, okay, we'll put it down in, into the links, and uh, yeah, all right, fantastic, okay. yeah, good, wonderful. So, any advice you'd like to leave us with? Any final final advice from our conversation? Oh, final final advice. Um, I, I think for all of us, students, um, educators, uh, be, everybody says this. Beth Claris, be hungry for knowledge, be curious, be grateful, and uh, never give up. That's what I'd say. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> Well, Tony, thank you so much for this fantastic conversation and sharing all, all your experiences with us. And we're looking forward to having you at the Design Education Forum. Uh, I'm looking forward to it too. Uh, this November. So, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.